close these. We expect people to come in. Good morning. Welcome to Session 13C. My name is Barbara and I'm the moderator this morning. Um, the speaker is Aaron. Aaron Sperrin. Yes. Okay. That works. He's president of E6S Industries and he's here to talk about Lean Six Sigma maturity and uh, employee. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Uh, I know I, I have stiff competition out there right now, so I appreciate the. Uh, Unless those rooms are just full and you need a place to sit. <laughs> I'm going to close this because I'm going to get distracted by uh, the background noise. So. so this is my first shameless plug. There will be some other ones that are in there that are a little bit more uh, subtle, but this one will be overt. I do, I do have a weekly podcast that comes out um, called the E-Success Methods Podcast, devoted to Lean Six Sigma talking a lot about agile product development as well now. Comes out weekly, you can get it on iTunes. I'm looking for anybody who wants to speak. I'm always open for anybody who wants to share the kind of things. About 1,400 weekly subscribers right now. Um, invite you to listen, invite you to contact me if you're interested in uh, participating as well. All right, so the, the basis of this particular presentation will be, uh, how do I know if I'm actually achieving the maturity I need in my Lean Six Sigma deployment. Uh, I'll give some backstory on how, how this came about. And how is this change, how, how did this particular measure differ from what, there's many other deployment sort of measures out there. And uh, I'll talk about why I chose not to go down the path of those other deployment measures. And then I'll talk to you about how this particular measurement works uh, and the, essentially the mechanics behind it show how it worked for me, and then actually talk about, all right, here are the challenges. If you choose to go this route, these are the challenges that I had with this. Uh, and if you can avoid some of the same, same pitfalls, uh, then it would all have been worth it. So the backstory, do I choose the red pill or the blue pill is, is really kind of something we, well, something I was facing. And, and the, the truth about the red pill or the blue pill was we were 10 years in to the deployment uh, management was basically saying all kinds of really great things, uh, and uh, you know it's part of our DNA. It's uh, we've hit critical mass. We've hit. We've achieved that paradigm shift that everybody says we're supposed to do when we are deploying Lean and Six Sigma. So it's okay. We can back off our training. We can reduce our budget in this area, and essentially, and that's what that's that's the cues I was getting from upper management. But this is what I was feeling. It's like, you know, if this were really true, shouldn't things be easier? Uh, I was the, essentially the, call it deployment, I call it redeployment lead. They had deployed many years before I got there, but there was a lot of refresh that I had to do once I got there as the, as the local master black belt. So for me, it just didn't feel right. I, don't, I did not believe we had achieved the maturity that our leadership was saying we had achieved. Many of our engineers weren't doing anything very differently. Our frontline operators certainly weren't doing anything very differently. However, we had, you know, all kinds, by our classical metrics that our management was looking at, everything was great. So I felt a disconnect and I wanted to understand what that was. So management celebrated the bonuses, yet line workers pretty much did nothing very different. So do I choose the red pill or the blue pill? Uh, I chose the red pill, <clears throat> which is uh, dig deeper and try to uncover the truth. And I don't want to, so the, the red pill, blue pill. So uh, the matrix, I think it actually predates the matrix. But the blue pill is if you swallow the blue pill, you, you prefer to live in the illusion state. If you swallow the red pill, you want to know the truth, uh, no matter how much it hurts, right? So what we were happening, what we came upon is it was harder to find big ticket improvements with a lot of financial benefits behind them. As you get further into your uh, deployment, the things that were easy to find that could pull a lot of financial benefits from, they become harder to find. Uh, and, and I actually see this as a good thing. I see this as a sign of maturity that's approaching. For instance, if you take a process from a one sigma to a three sigma process, it is easy to make large financial gains without much effort. 
when, you, when you're taking it from a three sigma process to a six sigma process, which is roughly where we were emerging at that time, it is harder to find those, those projects that uh, have a direct financial impact that you can measure directly to the profit and loss statement and say, yes, that project did that. Uh, you start to get into projects that are more aligned with strategic vision and are a little bit harder to say, yes, that had uh, clear financial benefits. Can I ask you, how is it that management was so convinced that this was going on so well? I think because this part, they found it harder to find those easy wins for, that had a large financial benefit meaning uh, all those surface issues had gone away. All those things that actually, in my opinion, were just kind of cleaning up old bad habits, but not necessarily digging very deep to make long-term improvements. Um, so they saw the, the emergence of clear, obvious, high-value projects were harder to find. Once you got rid of those high-value projects, did you change the yardstick at all to measure the program? So that's what I was trying to get to because uh, many of those high value projects had, were taken care of before I got there and I had become a part of a, a deployment that was, I, I believe, moving into a more mature, not, not mature, but maturing, I'll call it adolescent, just really starting to feel what it really means to dig deep into the program. So. Um, what I was proposing here was that we rechange how we look at it, but still some of those classic measures were still there because, uh, and I'll see in the challenges section, that's what we were accustomed to. Management wants to see the ROI um, and the, the softer cultural measures, which this measure is more of, um, don't speak in dollars and cents to, the, to that group. Okay, so the metrics haven't necessarily evolved, but the, uh, and the behaviors haven't changed. We've only really cleaned up from where we were. So here are the, some of the common deployment metrics that you may see in your, in your programs. Financial benefits, ROI. Uh, obviously, the, the hard part about this is it does, re, it does promote headcount reduction. So uh, I'd say in the first two years, you'll see a, a lot of big celebrations, uh, and you'll end up sabotaging your program pretty quickly if, if all your uh, efforts do is remove uh, some person's friend from their job the person they've been working with for a long time. Uh, there is a survival's guilt that, uh, that is there and actually will reduce the health of your deployment going forward. Competition for credit and or double dipping. Too many times I've had what I'll call non-value added conversations with people from other departments. Well, what, did, did Six Sigma really get credit for this or, or, or does our department get credit for that? I mean, we work together, but who gets credit? At the end of the day, it, in my opinion, it's like really who cares. But uh, we did have a lot of those conversations. And double dipping for those who um, I'll, claim, I'll came, claim credit in one area, somebody else will claim credit in the other area where it actually was only the same benefits that were counting twice. Uh, and you can't line them up with the profit and loss statement actually results in a loss, credibil loss of credibility for your deployment program because you're, you're claiming to save far more than you actually have saved. So that is, but that is a classical um, deployment metric. There's also maybe count of projects. How many of these projects or do we have going on? If you, if you assume better is, uh, more is better, you start to have, and I've seen this as well, you start to have very hollow projects of lesser value. You just look at, you're just playing the numbers rather than uh, digging deep to try to get the value from each project. And you kind of, uh, there's a bit, a bit of a loose connection to deployment health. And then there's rubrics uh, to try to capture what it's like with the culture uh, of the deployment. Uh, there are very, there are quite a bit of rubrics out there. Quality progress, uh, I'd say, in the last ten years has had, had at least seven articles on uh, survey survey methods to measure deployment health. My opinion is the, those particular ones that I found were a little bit too burdensome, had a bit of a cognitive load uh, when you're taking surveys, and now we're in a very heavy survey culture where there's a survey everywhere you turn, the value of the survey seems to go down and I myself do not have enough patience to take another survey. <laughs> I say that as you're filling out a survey for how well I'm speaking. I do not have enough patience to fill out another survey. Um, but we do need to get this information in. So basically, I found that those were a little bit too complex for this particular 
uh, audience. Now, there are, no matter what we say, there are inherent biases in surveys. And we, we try to take controls as much as we can, add more definition here and there. But at the end of the day, they kind of know what we'd like them to answer. So those biases are in there. They, would, they know what they, we would like them to answer in the survey. And uh, one of the moves I move for this particular change is to, instead of trying to minimize the bias, let's maximize the bias. Let's make it blatant and obvious what our biases are and enforce them to not make subtle differences. And I'll show that a little bit later. But if they're going to give me what I want, it's going to be very blatant and it's going to be a higher a higher, um, a bolder lie than, than uh, some of these other, re uh, other ways. I'll get into that. So what do we start? This, we really want to understand what is our healthy deployment. We want to understand what does a healthy deployment actually look like, and then we'll, we'll measure uh, how far we are from what we expect it to be. We eliminate the gray area, or what I'm calling the white lie, and we're getting to more direct questions Biases still exist, but are direct and blatant. So I'm actually moving away, and maybe I'm moving ahead. Yeah, two slides in. So let's just get to it. I'm killing Mr. Likert, uh, or at least his contribution to society. The Likert scale, this one to five scale, this particular type of scale is what leads to what I'll call the white lie and why I didn't use it. So if I, if I say roughly how engaged are you on the scale of one to five in Lean Six Sigma, if you're a person like me, you never give a five anyway. So we've already gone down to four. Even if it's bad, it's like, it's, is, it, is it a three bad, a three? I don't really like to go down by a three. So I can, even without giving out the survey, I can say, well, roughly four. Roughly four is what we uh, have for our engagement. So rather than encourage this little self-argument, maybe it's a white lie. It's like, well, it's a little bit better than a, a three. I know what they want me to do. I know they want it to be a higher score. Let's make it, let's take away the gray area and let's make it discrete binary instead of discrete ordinal, such as the Likert scale. So we get very direct with the questions. Are you doing this? Yes or no? They, the survey takers take on a little bit of an internal struggle and they say, well, I really want to answer yes, but in actuality, if I'm not going to be a blatant liar, uh, the answer is no. So this is, this is what we're trying to trying to uh, leverage right here is, is taking away this gray area in this particular, in this particular uh, approach. What this also does actually also simplifies the, in my opinion, the analysis afterward. Um, and I'll show that as well. Feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. How does it start? We got a set of vision. You have to know exactly what you think it should look like. If we have achieved a state of maturity in our Lean Six Sigma deployment, what would it look like? What are these behaviors? What would people be doing on a regular basis? Uh, what would management be doing? And what skill sets do we think should be common throughout our, our company? Then use those, those, that vision of how things should be to create the questions that you want to ask, these yes, no questions, these very direct do you display these kinds of behaviors? And get, and get pretty specific. There's a couple of uh, examples uh, further down. Then you can aggregate those scores. The one part about this is you will need larger data, data sets, larger sample sizes in order to get a good aggregate. For any of those people who will always answer yes to everything or any of those people who always answer, always answer no to everything, um, if you have enough data, you sort of, you sort of wipe out that, that noise. Take action. After you've, after you've done the work, the survey, there's a lot of information in there. Take action. And then when you, when you go to redeploy or go to uh, do the survey again, do you need new questions? Sort of uh, decide whether or not you want to alter your questions and then essentially iterate on this process right here, rinse and repeat. So for example, some of the sample questions you may ask, have you received any Lean Six Sigma training? Yes or no? In my deployment vision, I would expect most of my people to have received Lean Six Sigma training. Uh, whether it's basics, whether it's green belt or black belt, that'll all vary. Um, does your manager encourage Lean Six Sigma participation? Okay, make them go through that little bit of a struggle. I like my manager, but honestly, if I'm to be honest, yes or no? Do you believe it's an effective strategy? In the past three months, have you personally benefited from Lean Six Sigma? 
in this particular situation and believe that that's what a mature Lean Six Sigma culture would look like. So here are some uh, examples of that. So what I'm about to show is uh, the actual deployment of this survey. Yes, please. Um, because the, the management was so convinced that Lean Six Sigma was happening, were you scared that the, the employees might not be honest with saying, you know, I don't think it's happening? Right. Did you have that problem or face that at all? So I think I think I probably did have that uh, that fear. Um, the only thing I, I did guarantee all all the data came to me and to no one else. Um, I did guarantee anonymity unless they chose to share uh, their their email if if I wanted to follow up with anything. Um, so that was a, but all, that was all face value. That's all I could do is give them my word uh, because we didn't do any real blind studies on this one. What I got back. Based on the information I got back, I believe that I got very honest answers. Um, but that that differed depending on whether or not you were you were a uh, shop floor hourly employee or a senior level level leader. There, you could see there's quite a bit of stratification in what they believed uh, with the program. Um, but we'll also get to that. You know, when it came down to to uh, releasing the results of such a survey, uh, senior leadership did not feel that this was a good use of uh, information. <laughs> so, um, and, and you guys are actually the first in public to see it. I've moved on from that company. Okay, so um, coding yeses and nos as ones and zeros, right? That's basically what, what we've done here. A, a one would be a yes, a zero would be a no. It is based off of uh, directly to the question. We can take an average across each respondent, across all questions, and we take an average down the columns uh, across all respondents, and this gives a, an estimation of roughly, uh, on average, how are we doing relative? If if I've created my questions correctly, in theory, if we're fully mature, all of these should be 100%. Now, so where where we differ, that's where. So so basically, the entire premise is if we are looking the way we think we should look, all of this should be 100%. Wherever we are, that's the actual gap. How were these questions generated in the survey? Was it just you working on them, or was it a group that kind of came together to draw them up? Yeah, it was a small group of, of highly biased people who, um, they were all master black belts and black belts themselves, highly biased people who had a, uh, a strong belief on what things should look like. Um, leadership did not weigh in on this one. Okay, so from 2009 to 2011, first, first rolled it out in 2009, and uh, I wasn't terribly surprised with the results. You know, if I expected things to be at 100%, they were coming in at roughly 40%. It actually very much mirrored what I felt coming out of the, uh, the organization. And we had an ex extremely good uh, response rate of, uh, I think it was roughly 50% of all our employees took, took the, took the uh, survey. Uh, so in between these, what you don't see here yet is that action were taken as a result of the responses. So and I apologize, it's, it's roughly hard, it's very hard to see. But essentially on average, we were at 43% for 2009 and we moved the, the mean up to about 53%. Still not stellar, but a step in the right direction. And we actually shifted the distribution of how that would look where the bulk of the distribution was below average before, whereas now the bulk of the distribution was above average. And uh, so again, just steps in the right direction. Essentially what we did is senior leadership still stayed very positive with their responses to the, the survey and then we sort of started bridging the gap in the different geographies with uh, line level workers and mid level managers. So what you saw on the first one was just everything as a bulk. That was all territories, all, all respondents. But you, we can continue to break it down if you have a large enough data set. So this is broken down by hierarchy. Was it a manager, non-manager, or or uh, other salaried employee, uh, and in what, I guess that's just manager, non-manager salary, and, uh, and in what year. So you could see here the dis a bit of a dis disparity between how managers and non-managers sort of responded. Managerial thought things were better than hourly workers thought they were, and actually non-managerial were uh, between the different regions. They actually were, um, sometimes they answered like a senior manager, sometimes they answered like a line level worker depended on the geography we were in. Corporate headquarters, 
middle managers answered like a senior manager would. Our uh, satellite manufacturing facilities, they answered more like an hourly uh, worker would have answered. It was, was kind of interesting to see how that worked. Do you think that comes from like the communication on throughout the organization in terms of the Lean Six Sigma programs and things like that? Yeah, I think it's not just communication, but also um, they were left out. You know, when it came down to it, we, we you know, uh, before I had gotten there, they had gotten trained on some basics in Lean Six Sigma and then mostly ignored because they didn't believe that the big, the big projects could come from there. And a lot of these were remote areas, Mexico and Brazil. We weren't going down there. We hadn't really infused it in those areas at all, in my opinion. Then you can break it down some more. You can actually break it down by question level, again, if you have enough data. Uh, so a specific question, you can see where, where our particular gaps are in this one. Have you been trained as a Lean Six Sigma green belt, black belt, or champion? Yes or no. And if you look at these different shapes, they represent whether or not they're manager, upper manager, uh, or uh, salary, or non-manager hourly employee. And this is just specifically toward this category I've called organizational commitment. This is, this is what we've committed to giving you uh, as, the, as, the, um, as a worker here with regards to Lean Six Sigma. Does your manager encourage Six Sigma participation? And you can see how, uh, whether or not it did a step change between 2009 and 2011. A bit of an eye chart, meaning it is difficult to see, but if you are the one dissecting the data, uh, this is how I've uh, been able to visualize it using just uh, Excel. And broken it down even further to a geographical region. This one, just, just US and Canada, again. Some instances we've reached the green, some instances and here we're still sort of in the red. So that uncovers the, the and pri helps prioritize the gaps we want to address. And at least one open-ended question. So we had a lot of questions that were direct yes, no questions. Do you, do you, uh, do you see this? Is this your perception? Uh, do you have these behaviors? Um, but an open-ended question is actually where all the, the wealth of direction comes from. Uh, so just affinitizing these open-ended these open-ended questions gives us an opportunity to say, okay, what would they like more from us as deployment leaders? Where do our where do our people see it that they'd like more? So it started off with uh, in in the year one that we needed to improve our project selection and uh, get more active involvement from people who were in in the in the you know in the the worker bees in in the line of work. Uh, so we attacked those, and in the, in, the, in the second year, it turned into you need it turned from you need to get better projects and turned more into hey. I'm seeing more activity and I'd like to become more involved with this. So that I started asking, there was a bit of a pull from the organization asking for the training. Still want to improve the projects, but uh, they were a lot happier with the level of communication that was coming to them. So in the two years time, we saw a bit of a shift in at least uh, the line level worker attitude toward it. It went from, we've heard the words, we don't understand what it means to, I like what I'm seeing. I'd like to get how I can get more involved and I'm starting to feel a little bit of the benefit. Again, we're not reaching necessarily into very, uh, we're still in the 50 percentile range, so, but we've made a large step forward. And uh, I should say, because I was a former company, I, I keep saying we, but that was them now. And those open-ended questions, and since it's anonymous, do employees ever kind of vent some of their frustrations that have nothing to do with the Lean Six Sigma? He, um, well, obviously, there's, there's that opportunity. Uh, I'm, I'm searching my memory banks at this point. Uh, and I don't believe so. I, I don't believe I saw that. Um, but they will vent what their current bias is on what Lean Six Sigma means. You know, Lean is all about you know, getting rid of, of uh, people or reducing costs or, or something like that. And these also were uh, in multiple languages, so it's both Spanish and Portuguese. So I actually had to go through and do some translation uh, when we did that as well, just as an FYI. But yeah, open it up. Uh, it was for my eyes only. Um, so they were allowed to see whatever they wanted. <laughs> okay, so our challenges and criticism. So some of the, the larger challenges I've had, um, say from leadership, call it statistics and liars. Uh, they, they did not quite understand or appreciate the method behind it, meaning uh, well, first of all, the numbers, the, what came out from this didn't jive with their particular beliefs on how the, the health of the organization was with Lean Six Sigma. Um, so automatically, 
going to uh, reject it a little bit. Uh, and then, because the, the approach, it took out all the precision of the Likert scale, um, and it just went with yes, no, discrete binary approach, and just looked at the data in different combinations as a result, even some people who I might have expected to be on board were a little bit skeptical. Didn't think that they could get as much information out of such a simple 10, 15 questions as I did. Um, I, I stand by it, but anyway, some people fundamentally were not on board with the, the method. And, and then there was people who were taking the survey who had to go through a little bit of a uh, personal, uh, personal struggle and saying, you know, this person is saying, I have to choose yes or I have to choose no, but I know better. This is not applicable to me, right? There were a few instances where I would accept not applicable, but I didn't have it as an option. If anybody put not applicable, I put it as a no. So, and then if we ever got to being really precise about this measurement in a maturity, maybe in some areas we don't need to be 100% mature, maybe we can be 80% mature. Um, so there were a couple of questions that weren't applicable to everybody, but I didn't want to leave that as a scapegoat, but some people still wrote it in. Anyway, uh, upper management believed it was below them. Shop floor people believed it was above them. So uh, it, it's kind of interesting how, how these things roll out and how people answer these questions. When you've set out a vision and it's not been part of a paradigm that they've accepted, they tend to reject it. So there are some of those. It didn't stop the actions we needed to take. It did, however, um, impact how public we could be with the findings and, uh, and how, we, how, we, how we marketed the, uh, the information we shared. So some chose the blue pill to maintain the illusion. It was not my job to do so. That's it in a nutshell. Any questions? Can you put this, um, the survey at the back end of the process? Have you had uh, instances where you've developed the survey in advance to help guide the initiative as it was? No, I haven't had that pleasure. Um, I, came in, I came in later in the deployment where um, everybody thought we were doing well. Uh, and it just didn't feel right. So I, I came up with the, an alternate approach to that. Um, but I haven't had the pleasure of, of, of what it would look like or rolling it out early. I, I imagine that I would set my sights a little bit more short term on some of these questions rather than, uh, even rather than establishing my long term maturity vision. I might establish a, uh, a three to five year vision and see how well we're doing on that and then continue to um, modify the questions as we, as we matured. Did the organization have a goal for, uh, I think one of the questions was, did you get green belt, black belt, or champion training, and then were you certified? And I don't see how there could be a disconnect with upper management if when you implemented the lean, you would set a goal to get training done, mm -hmm. and potentially through your HR process, each manager would have a goal that X number of your employees will go through this so that that at least that as a metric won't there be no discussion. Right. If that was a target and that was reported upward, then there should be no question on that. If it was really driven through the right. the process of goals and objectives down to the employee level. Yeah, and I'd say that's something that didn't really exist. Um, and we had uh, significant turnover both in uh, upper management and middle management and, and frankly in, in ten years um, line level workers. Whereas we thought we had it in, in the upfront stages and probably trained up half of our people at least. Uh, and then over the course of five to 10 years, a lot of those people had, had uh, turned over. Um, but uh, you know, the only real metric was if you, were, if you were trained, you were expected to certify within a year. So I had a metric on how many of those certified within a year. And then you know how metrics work. We make sure that we hit that goal. Um, one way or another, <laughs> but um, but uh, also you know there was a rough estimate that we should hit you know 50% of our salary employee uh, base for green belt level training, and that was a goal, but not really a hard set goal. We achieved it in in at corporate headquarters, but um, hadn't even scratched the surface at any other location. That's that. In, in general way, when it was rolled out, were they KPI goals that were supposed to? You must the company to achieve, and were those achieved in my room when they right. deploy this? I mean, you have a three-year company, mm -hmm. and those KPIs will happen. I mean, otherwise, how do you, you know, yeah. you know, we're doing this, but are you doing Yeah. 
Most of the KPIs were centered around um, uh, hard financial benefits, uh, the number of uh, financial benefits you got uh, either uh, annually. That's most of the KPIs were driven around essentially ROI um, and not on how well are we um, how well, how well are we employing this into our uh, regular routine that was not part of it? There was essentially no cultural aspect to measuring the deployment um, before I got there. From a management's point of view, if it's not delivering to the bottom line, why do it? Are we just spinning our wheels and not right. getting anywhere? Well, I guess, I guess that's the argument you know, we take if we just choose to go you know, past what I'll call the low-hanging fruit. Um, if we choose, my point of view is, if we choose truly projects that are uh, geared toward strategic vision, they are long. They are long term. So any projects that we do, they won't may not be pay off in the same year, which is what we were getting with uh, the low hanging fruit and some of it, call it uh, ground fruit. So from a management point of view, yes, ROI. And we always had the CFO saying, um, what are we going to get from this on our P and L? That that was uh, front and center there all the time, and uh, I guess. What I'm saying is the more mature you get into this and the more it becomes part of, say, culture, the less you're going to be able to tie it directly back to a hard, hard benefit in a short time frame. I agree with the short time frame. I think what we need to do is to build that bridge from what we're doing today to where they are going to see the ROI tomorrow. Right. Well, I, I think what it is is if you stop doing it, you're going to create those issues where if you now do a project, you get to ROI. Right. And what you have to say is that once you've invested and you You've had all these large projects and you've saved X amount of money. If you don't maintain, then you're going to create those problems where you're going to then yeah. have to reinvest to save those again. So mm -hmm. you want to continue investing to prevent having to go out and find those big ROIs. So the investment, you should be able to tell that financial story to keep the training. One of the comments you made was, we need to do the training. Well, that's going to prevent those big issues coming up where you now have to go after that ROI, mm -hmm. but if you train the people, they're thinking about it ahead of time, you don't have those big issues causing those drains dollar-wise. I think Wade touched on it a little bit this morning when he said, okay, when the engineers aren't working on problems, we've got to repurpose them to work on new products and new processes Future problems. to generate new revenue, mm -hmm. not just cut costs from the old revenue. Right. Completely agree. I think it's a harder sell because it's a, a bit of a softer story. Um, and if you're dealing with, um, uh, which, you know, shareholder value is the big one that keep, keeps coming down. What will this put in my shareholder pocket at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year? If you if you didn't have a strong answer, it was uh, it was a, a little bit of a ding against that particular pro program. As I said, if we don't if we don't keep that bridge, right? The project's gonna go away. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much for your attention. Appreciation for oh. job well done. Thank you very much.